Birmingham has a legacy of black entrepreneurship that people don't even realize was nationally significant. We want to perpetuate that history. Entrepreneurship gave black folks the freedom to live, move, and be. Fourth Avenue was a place black folks could just be. We contributed to the growth of Birmingham. But now that Birmingham is on a new path, we have to ask, who gets to be Birmingham? Yeah. What's up, y'all? <laughs> uh, welcome again to our series, How Do I Get I? Uh, how do I um, keep my brick and mortar in COVID-19? We're excited to have a special guest with us today. What's up, Bobby? Trying to make sure I unmute myself. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Straight up. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, man, uh, who you are, what you do and uh, excited to have you today. Yeah, so um, Bobby Boone, founder of And Access. Um, we're a retail real estate strategy firm. Uh, so I primarily work with you know, cities, real estate developers, small business on really navigating um, real estate around entrepreneurship, uh, underserved communities, et cetera, which you know typically is a, a large struggle. Um, you know when you're considering both of those things, and so you know my work really spans everything from policy to finance um, to you know in store design to really understand how you kind of leverage real estate in the most optimum way. Most deaf, most deaf. Um, so. Uh, what would you say uh, your your mission is for your business? And tell us how you started your business. Man. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I would. So we have a saying that's like retail that reaches people, which is like something that I really believe in. And when we say retail, it's retail and restaurants because you know you think about all the businesses that really serve communities, um, places where people you know often you know latch on to you know in, in some immigrant communities, you know that's like the only opportunity for jobs. You know some you know people that are reentering citizens, that's the only opportunities for jobs. So really like showcasing how you know the small businesses and communities are like rooted in a place and how uh, it can really, you know, serve as not only like a wealth generating opportunity, but really a face of the community. So, um, and then, you know, going back to like the question around how did I start? So, you know, my background is in like architecture and urban planning. And I served, worked at a consulting practice that did work for retail and hotels, et cetera, and restaurants across the world. So, you know, some of my clients were Fortune 500 companies like Hilton and Marriott, Corner Bakery, and then, you know, also worked with like neighborhoods and real estate developers. Um, what I noticed in all of that is like, this is a system that just is not working for black people. <laughs> like a lot of times it's like, we don't have the networks, the understanding the access to capital, you know, understand like, you know, how do you actually receive the access to capital and, and or, you know, some business connections in order to create a partnership and all these various scenarios that result and really wanted to translate that over into the black community. Um, so I went to go work in the city of Detroit where it was really interesting. Um, that work, you know, I focused on retail growth. Um, so, you know, some of the businesses were established, trying to figure out how can they open up a second and third location within the region. Also, you know, looking at, you know, the other side of, of the conversation, which was, hey, how do you help start up businesses and, and their kind of first establishment, coaching them through some of those decisions. In the city of Detroit, like, you know, many communities, uh, Black, you know, and, and other minority communities, they don't really have like a robust brokerage network, you know, Black or, you know, 
or brokers that group serve the that community. So that level of education is oftentimes hard to come by. And so trying to get to share that knowledge as well as escalate, you know, all of the issues that the businesses are facing to city departments and people, the lenders who are giving out loans and to understand, you know, what's really going on. So, you know, from all of that, I decided to start and access to say, hey, how do you actually like leverage the best of like this corporate understanding of how this real estate system works in, in retail, et cetera, with, you know, the true needs of small businesses and in the, you know, black, brown communities across the nation. Man, that's super dope. And that sounds like we should have met you five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was still learning. Well, I'm still learning currently. So <laughs> it's, it's a work in progress. Well, no, that, that's super dope. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I've seen some of your stuff around passion around black historic districts, you know, which obviously is near and dear to our heart because that is our entire world. But you also have a Birmingham connection, right? Yep, yep. My mom born and raised in Birmingham. So I spent, you know, most holidays every summer growing up <laughs> in Birmingham, yeah, with my grandparents, uncles, cousins, etc. Yeah, I have a large segment of my family who went to Ramsey and um, et cetera. So they've yeah. I've, I felt like I've always been semi-Birmingham native. Um, you know, I grew up in Atlanta, like school there. Um, but, you know, all of the you know, many months in the year that I spent in Birmingham was near and dear to my heart. So uh, the, the question is, have you had Green Acres? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Just how many pieces yeah. am I allowed to have at a time? Right. <laughs> so um, right, right. that was always, you know, going as a child is like, all right, we're going. How many, like, you know. <laughs> Can I only have three, please? <laughs> yeah, well, man, I'm excited. Uh, so today, um, Bobby's going to give us just some really important tips for retailers. You hear, you hear the mission uh, and the passion of his business. And here, this series about is reimagining technical assistance uh, and uh, just reimagining just how we have conversations. And so we're glad to have owner experts because I feel like you can show it better than you can tell me. Like that's who we are, that's who we are as a culture. So we're gonna give it to Bobby. Make sure you like, share, put stuff in the comments and uh, we will come back and have live Q and A after this presentation. So over to you, man. I appreciate it. Well, so today, you know, we're talking about how do I keep my brick and mortar? Um, this conversation, you know, some of it is, you know, very high level. Some of it's really deep around, you know, very specific strategies. Um, try to keep it, you know, in the next 15 minutes so we can have a conversation about it. So, you know, tip one is with brick and mortar is really remember the basics. There's a lot of conversation that's occurring across the nation around like experiential retail, you know, bringing in e-commerce and all of these things. However, you know, most customers are coming to you because you you know, have a certain type of customer service, a product that they enjoy and a price point that they can afford. And so, you know, when you're designing whatever your strategy is for your brick and mortar, remember like the purpose of, you know, retail and brick and mortar retail is really to kind of meet those innate needs um, of the community. And so thinking about, you know, what does that look like? Yeah, it's like, hey, we're a point of community intersection. We, um, we, you know, allow for, you know, conversations that happen at the barbershop or, you know, families that dine at the restaurant, et cetera, all really ingrained. And so how do you like create that experience that, you know, the customers truly, truly want? Um, the niche like idea is really just like, all right, where's their gap in the market? Who's like, what do you see like is not being, what need is not being met? Um, in the community, and what is what can you offer that they can't receive either online or other stores? And so, you know, thinking about what that looks like, um, you know, specifically during COVID is really interesting because, you know, it could be something as simple as, you know, hey, I realize that you know many of my customers want to, you know, they they still want to try on things. However, you know. We can't allow 
have them in store, other customers will feel unsafe for X amount of time. So let's figure out strategies where we can, you know, allow them to go try things on at home and return policies, et cetera. And, you know, some of something, some of those things may not be offered by some of your competitors. So, you know, within that niche is oftentimes like best products and services. Um, one of the things that I've realized through um, through COVID is that if you're able to get to those products and services that, you know, one are very good sellers, but also consider profit margin. So how much are you making off of each product and how do you increase the amount that you're selling of those products or services. And so thinking about, you know, whether that's like a promotional opportunity that's associated with it or product merchandising, meaning like where is it placed within a store? And so people will be more likely to grab the product off the shelf and actually make the purchase or to select from a menu of options that specific product or service. Um, and so if you think about like a menu, when you're going to a restaurant, your eye is typically drawn, you know, across the menu. Things that are inside of a box on a menu are often overlooked because they're seen as like extra, um, like they, they, it's something that, you know, most people don't look at when they're reviewing a menu. It's just something about consumer psychology associated with that. I have no idea why the brain works like that, but it does. Um, and so thinking about ways that you, know, you can say, all right, I'm bringing attention to these products, whether that's listing them first, putting them in bold text, um, or in a certain color. However, do not put them in a box. Um E-commerce. I know many of you have probably been exploring um, e-commerce, you know, whether that is online delivery through like uh, uh, Uber Eats or a, a DoorDash or some type of delivery platform or creating a store on, on your website, etc. cetera. Um, one of the things that you should really consider within e-commerce is that it can be an operational headache. And so that really is you know, understanding where do you, one, store the um, goods that you're trying to ship out so and preserve them. So if that's food, you have to figure out, all right, how does that differ from the food that you're putting out on to the front of, into the front of house? Um, and then how do you keep that warm until the delivery person gets there? How do you, um, you know, get it delivered? And so thinking about that as a strategy. Um, then when soft goods, you know, things that can be returned, how do you actually process returns? And so if you, you have to think about each of those four stages when you're considering e-commerce and your brick and mortar space, because, you know, you can, one, oversell something online and then you're eating into the inventory that's in the store. And then if your customer is unable to receive their good or service, they will then be, you know, turned off from the brand and pushed into a scenario where, you know, hey, this is not beneficial you know, to me. I'm not going to come back and repeat purchases if I'm oftentimes, you know, left without what I'm actually coming for. So, you know, within e-commerce, it's a very delicate balance. You know, consider your options, understand, you know, how your customers actually find out about you. Um, do you have, you know, existing email list? Do you have strong social media campaigns, et cetera, that you can leverage. And if you don't, you have to realize there's an acquisition period in order to get there. And so what that looks like is, you know, hey, how are we collecting emails from our existing customers? You know, are we going to pay for targeted marketing on social media and other platforms in order to capture new customers? All of those things come with the cost to both time and revenue. And so thinking about um, these strategies intently is very important in order to you know, get to a point, how does that integrate within a brick and mortar experience? Um, meeting needs. Uh, so, you know, right now through COVID, we've a lot of talked about delivery, curb and in-store pickup. Um, and so it's just, you're really understanding 
how are customers moving within the Birmingham market? Um, so one of the things that you can do, which Google actually provides for free, they've been doing mobility reports and saying how people are actually moving from their house into the store. And so you know, I'll try to post a link in the chat prior to jumping off um, for how to access that report. But it's really a, a great strategy to understand, all right, should I ramp up these specific offerings in terms of you know being creating a safe space for my potential customers long term retaining customers um you know how are you communicating with them you know is it playful is it you know like very welcoming etc you know one you have to maintain a strategy for communications long term um you know, that you know, one can include email marketing as mentioned previously, but it could also be, you know, various loyalty programs and specials. So one of the things and strategies that I recommend, you know, many businesses pursuing is just looking at how do you get them back in the door in the shortest period of time? And so if your restaurant say, hey, if you come back in five days, you get X percentage off or a free drink or, you know, some other type of promotional item in order to, you know, have more of a guaranteed sale um, at that point. Grants. I mean, I know we've been bombarded by various financial support through COVID. You know, as a small business owner, I'm always trying to navigate which one is best for me um, and which one do I have the highest likelihood of actually receiving. And that's hard. Um, and so one of the applications I recommend here is Hello Alice. Um, so they are a platform that you know provides um lots of resources uh, and it's uh, it's machine learning which means they utilize a lot of data from some of which you contribute as well as you know other of your peers or fellow business owners within your category and they will say hey you know there's this new grant that you're eligible for and therefore it's an open line of communication that is available so the website there is www.helloalice.com um feel free to you know check it out it's you know pretty seamless application process from you, know, you can go online from your phone or your computer in order to do it um and i also recommend getting help you know a big part of this is really around you know how do you get through all of these required documents? You know, it's taking you out of your business. What does it look like for you to, you know, either reach out to Urban Impact, reach out to other organizations who are supporting you, um, you know, in many ways uh, long term and, and then to successfully apply? And so we understand that, you know, that's a major hurdle. And so, you know, consider other support as well, such as, you know, the the teenagers in your household or you know your family members etc to help you navigate that process this is one of the more technical ones um so understanding your lease is like a very high and primary strategy that you can um deploy in order to really uh, create new opportunities. You know, some leases are very strict and they don't allow for, you know, additional expansion of your products and services. So that's the, one of the first questions I would ask, um, you know, when you're looking, reviewing your lease. And these, these leases, these lease terms would be um, listed in the, uh, you know, near, like in the middle of, the least typically I'm just going in, in very generic terms um, and it would you know be under subletting and assignment will be one of the things that you should look at um, as well as exclusions and so exclusions um, dictate whether or not you can expand your products or services because um, some leases say hey I'm an ice cream shop you cannot sell coffee because there's a coffee shop down you know in the same shopping center um, or you know many other reasons that you know could be ingrained in there um, second you know it's looking at subtenanting um, and so in assigning your lease and so if you can subtenant you know some of your space to another business you know it could be you know something that's very um, complimentary so say hey I am uh, 
a co coffee shop, I might want to sublease some some counter space to a sandwich, you know, or bakery um, outlet, and so they can, you know, people can sell their products, or another business owner can sell their products in your space, and then part of that income is towards your rent. And so thinking about strategies really to leverage that as an opportunity is something to proceed with. Um, and then finally is, you know, can you fully assign your lease? That means, hey, here's another business that's going to occupy my space temporarily because I don't think I can continue operating as we're, we're, um, as we're getting through the pandemic recovery, et cetera. And so that will allow you to, you know, still maintain the space if, you know, once um, full recovery and reopening occurs, how do you, and to get, you know, your customers back in the door and you're making enough revenue in order to sustain that over time. So those are three um, initial strategies to proceed with in your lease. Um, and then there's the second step of that is, you know, communicating with your landlord. And I put lender here, too, because, you know, some businesses also own their property, but, you know, most are, are leasing. And so in the idea of leasing your property, what are you know ways to really um, engage your landlord, respecting that you know they are a business too. So they have to produce rent in order to pay you know their mortgage bills or other um, property uh, costs that's associated with you know keeping the heat and air or repairs done, et cetera. Hopefully your landlord is is providing all of those services. Um, but also you know thinking about strategies to say, hey, can we enter into a percentage rent deal. Um, so that's saying, hey, I'm only making X percentage of what I was making prior to COVID. Can I, you know, see a similar percent reduction in my um, rental rate? How do you continue to, you know, check to provide that information to your landlord and then continue to negotiate what those payment terms would be in order to sustain your business. Um, you know, on the lender side, it's, you know, much more tricky because, you know, they have many federal standards, et cetera, that they are required to obtain. And so that, you know, really relies on, you know, who, who the bank is in terms of the mortgage. Um, you know, if it's fun, it's a, if it's a local bank, they're typically, you know, more, flexible with their terms than you know national banking operations and so thinking about ways to you know proactively have those lines of communication open um, to you know avoid eviction or foreclosure so communication is key here and then finally which is you know seemingly a, a easy one is just you know how are you engaging with the community um you know some of the businesses that I've seen across the nation who've you know, done well, um, they have like created new products to like show, say, hey, I'm really, really trying here. I'm trying to figure out how to better serve you and your needs navigating this pandemic as well as making income. And then also telling them saying, hey, we could really use your support in buying this or, you know, what, how else can we, you know, continue to serve you? Can we, cre you know, can we engage in conversation, whether that is, you know, through a digital platform or calling some of your most loyal customers and saying, what are, what are ways that we can change and support? Um, I know that's, you know, time consuming and difficult. Um, however, you know, when you think about, you know, at, when you think about you know sustaining your brick and mortar day, it's all really about revenue. And so think in considering you know those loyal customers and the ones who want to see you around for the longest, create strategies specifically for them. So with that, um, you can feel free to contact us. Uh, you know, I'm Bobby Boone. I'm not sure why this background turned to this weird blue color but um you know the, here's my email feel free to reach out we are um always ready to support small businesses specifically as it relates to their brick and mortar strategies um you know that's ranging from restaurants to retail to grocery etc um and how they support the black neighborhoods that they serve man appreciate it that's excellent Fantastic. We did have one question in the comment. Uh, Candace asked, what colors do you suggest to attract and keep customers in your store? 
i.e. targets hold on most of us. <laughs> yeah, there's something about the atmosphere that makes you want to stay and spend, even if you're only going there to one or two items. Thank you so much for that question. It's a great question. Yeah, thank you, Candice. Um, that's, yeah, it it ranges. So Target actually has a very neutral color palette. Like they have their, you know, red Target sign, which draws your eyes to certain sections. However, when you actually look at the um, merchandising, it's, you know, it's, it's done in a very artful way. So they provide, you know, their home section and like actually stage areas that provide you an opportunity to kind of look at all types of products in one area instead of only saying, hey, here's the candle section, even though you can still go to the candle row aisle, but, you know, on the, 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 shelves that are fronting the walking um, aisles, you see more of that very mixed um, approach to merchandising your products. And so one of the strategies that I would just proceed with is not necessarily specifically a color. It's, you know, how are you showcasing kind of best in class products back to, you know, what I was saying around highlighting and, and like displaying um, some of those products or services um, so that more and more customers will latch on. And then you know that they're the best sellers. So then they'll end up, you know, maybe spend a little bit more time looking for something similar or something that complements that. Most well, Steph, great. Um, I think that wraps up the questions that we have. That was a great question anyway. Um, we'll take any more questions, but uh, one of the things that I did put in the chat I uh, used the Google machine to find the Google mobility tracker. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's uh, really cool, um, as well as I think Apple has a version of it as well. Um, so that's ex extremely cool. And uh, so last thing, you know, you have anything else to leave us with, uh, with your time? Sure. Um, so I would say, you know, if there are, if it gets to a point where you're you're really like weighing the pros and cons of, of like keeping your store open, you know, I would say talk to you know advisors before you completely let go of your lease because sometimes there's val there's value in your lease, so you can sell your lease to another business, um, saying or you know a lot your um, equipment, etc. So just so it won't just be a complete exit and you, you know, are still left with a, a large debt. Um, another thing is, you know, on the other side, how are you pushing forward? Like, you know, like, all right, what are um, strategies you have not considered? You know, what are the things that, you know, I stay, I remain inspired by is just, you know, there's this, um, it's, blog or digest, I'm not sure what it's called, retail or it is retail dive and a restaurant dive um, that amass like what's happening, kind of national brands, local business, all types of innovations within the marketplace and look at that. You know, utilize retaildive.com and say, hey, oh, they're doing this. Let me actually see if that makes sense for my business and have a critical, you know, thinking kind of conversation around that and designing, you know, new solutions that, you know, maybe seem way far fetched at first. Man, and excellent. So, my quick follow up question, because this is so key. What does a credentialed advisor for retail strategy look like? I was, it looks like <laughs> you. Uh, but, but seriously, throughout this series, we've had accountants, um, commercial insurance folks, and, and one of the challenges we face um, are, you know, when we sometimes encounter clients, they have already seen the wrong person, <laughs> right? They have seen the snake oil salesman. So if you could leave us with what a credentialed retail strategy advisor looks like, um, and we've already put your information in the chat. <laughs> um, that, yeah. yeah. And so I would I would say, you know, as someone who will prioritize kind of your business needs um, and, you know, a, a way that 
one of the things that I always look for, I'll say, I'll just, I'll, I'll just back up a little bit. One of the things that I always look for is, you know, when people are supporting like me personally and my personal finances, what are they, what do they get out of it if they engage with me and what do they get out of it if they don't? And so if they are willing to have a conversation with you in a way that is like helpful, even if they're like, you're having signed a piece of paper, et cetera, that's somebody that you probably want to keep around. Like, you know, let's actually talk about, you know, what's challenging you and move forward with that. Yes, that includes talking about legal structures, that includes someone that could talk about accounting, that includes someone that could talk about, you know, your business for like long-term organizational capacity, et cetera. That those are all, you know, key assets, but they, you know, it's rare that you're gonna find that in one person. So look for, you know, the specific needs you have but you know at first you just need to understand the strategy and a lot of times that strategy is financial but sometimes it's just related for operations like are there good mentors that are in the environment that you can also look to so it's like hey i know that they've been running a really successful business can i just talk to them for like 30 minutes you know and then figure out a way to move forward from there bobby we've enjoyed our time together uh this has been great uh, we're going to have you uh, on andaccess.com, andaccess.com. You know where to hit them up. And uh, we're so glad. Next week, we will be uh, on Instagram Live. We're switching it up on with District Business Fly V on how to brand your business on social media. Then after that, we will uh, go back with uh, Lakeithia Pierce on Death and Taxes Part 1. <laughs> and uh, we will wrap up our series uh, with a food truck summit with the city of Birmingham, Whitney Simone uh, and uh, Ariel Smith of the Food Truck Scholar. So we're excited to have you again, like and share. You know how to do it and uh, keep it locked every Tuesday uh, to be Birmingham. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.